You're listening to MedEx, the Medical Extrusion Podcast, presented by U.S. Extruders. Extrude with confidence. Custom extrusion equipment designed for you and your application. Hey, everybody. Steve Maxson here. Welcome back to the MedEx Podcast. Today's episode is focused on market dynamics, heat shrink tubing, and laser processing. Our guest is Barry Schnur, CEO of David Schnur Associates, DSA. DSA provides consulting and materials expertise. And over the last 40 years, DSA has been involved with the development and commercialization of countless medical devices. Hey, Barry, I know you're a busy guy traveling all over the place, so I really appreciate you taking some time out to join me on the MedEx podcast today. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's great to see you. I'm really excited about our conversation because you're so well connected in the med tech industry, both commercially and technically. So I'm excited to hear your input on the activity going on and just the kind of a snapshot of the industry. But before we do that, I want you to please tell us a little bit about DSA. Unlike most manufacturers representatives that have kind of a discrete territory, you know, the Northeast, Minneapolis, West Coast, you have a large territory in North America as well as internationally in a very broad um, offering as well. So please give us, our listeners, a little snapshot of DSA. Sure, I appreciate that. Yeah, so the company, David Stern Associates, was started by my parents 45 years ago. And so we are continuing to grow, obviously, second generation thing. I've been involved in it for about 30 years. And uh, basically, as you said, I mean, we're a manufacturer's rep, sort of classic in that. But the difference is that we are very focused on the medical device and life science business. My dad is a chemical engineer by training. And basically, we've always had a very materials focus, problem solving type of uh, approach to the industry. And that I think really fits with medical devices where we've started in Northern California and grew in the medical device business with our customers as the kind of less invasive, high value angioplasty mm -hmm. industry, right? Starting with angioplasty yeah. and with Guidant and, and folks like that here. So what happened is we always had a Western US territory focus and we used to do everything from coffee makers to cars and aerospace and anywhere that they used advanced materials. But as the California market kind of started to change and focus and things went offshore, you know, we realized that there was a unique kind of value that we could offer into particularly the R&D sections of advanced materials and advanced devices. Um, as far as the growth in territory and space, that actually we we really try to stay close to our customers and i know everyone says that but for me what that meant was when we saw that our custom our california and western u.s customers were becoming global manufacturing entities that we really needed to follow those devices and follow that business where it went i think the other thing that we do that is really important for us is these long-term relationships and that's important because yep. medical devices take, you know, three to eight years, maybe longer to, mm -hmm. to get to market. And it starts out with a, an R&D group that doesn't end up owning the product when it, when it eventually transitions. And so frequently we've been privileged to be a part of the early stage venture funded conversation in Israel, in Ireland, in, in the U.S., and then actually follow the acquisition through the transaction then and eventually maybe it ends up at Medtronic and, mm -hmm. and we can actually share some of the early stage design insights. So it's long-term relationships there, long-term relationships with our partners. Um, we, we represent some of, uh, we think, the most innovative and interesting suppliers to the medical device industry out there. And it doesn't work if it's not for a long time. Yeah, and I think knowing a lot of your folks on, on your team, they're more than commercial people. They're very technical as well. Well, about half of them have engineering degrees. Um, the rest of us, you know, need to pretend. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think that key interaction, that key discussion is with um, 
with R and D or again with technical sourcing yeah. and helping to find a, a fit for designing custom materials using capabilities that may or may not be commercially advertised. We like to think that we're a resource in that way, both for our, our principals, our partners, and for our customers. Right. Uh, and really sort of qualifying the right the right fit for a manufacturer. Okay. Based on all that, you have a, a really good pulse on the industry and new developments going on. What can you share with us about the activity, both from a med tech OEM and contract manufacturing space, just generally in the market for the development of new devices? Sure. I qualify this. We talk to a ton of our, our customers. They are the experts in medical right. devices, right. right? And I think, you know, there, there are things that, that you and I, that we know, mm -hmm. we know about extrusion. We know about how to make things, right? Yeah. It amazes me all the time what, what our customers are actually doing. And, and we're really privileged to be a part of that. Absolutely. Um, what we see is just tremendous um, energy and uh, new product development, both from a contract manufacturing point of view, in other words, an outsourced design and development point of view, which is tremendously different from what it was 10 years ago. I mean, the that uh, space was fairly, you know, I, I meant to look up some numbers. I, I don't think they're honestly available in mm -hmm. a way that, that makes sense, but that, that space has just been grown out in a tremendously. And the scope of each of those outsourced design development programs has also grown. I think it used to be that those well, people were a little more hesitant about outsourcing anything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. today that's not true, right? I mean, when you have trusted established partners that you know have done a good job for you in outsourced development, people are willing to go back and, and do it again. Uh, so both on that outsource kind of contract development, contract manufacturing point, but also um, small company, medium-sized company, there is a mm -hmm. tremendous dynamism in in the market and people looking for new solutions to do things. Now, that has, of course, coincided as we come out of the pandemic with the tremendous constraints in material supply and like, you know, people keep using it and say, oh, it's a perfect storm of this because there's actually a, a even pre-pandemic mm. chain of events, including storms in Texas and, uh, you know, things that, that began sort of a, a rolling supply chain crisis, particularly in polymers, uh, which we're still living with. Yeah. And, uh, you know, before we were talking about the impending you know, disruption from PFAS legislation and, and other environmental concerns and issues which nobody really knows com the complete impact of these things coming down. Um, that being said, I think what, uh, what has happened is that, you know, when you you have a, a company, you have an idea, you have a device that you want to develop, you're going to figure out a way to do it. And, yep. and customers are tremendously uh, inventive and innovative as far as, and insistent on, on getting there, right? And so they right. found resources, they found ways of getting around the fact that, you know, stainless steel wire has a 20 week lead time that that's not going to work for anybody. And so right. figure out a way to do it. Yeah, we're going to get into that a little bit next with with the supply of heat shrink tubing, right? And that's a good transition to talk about heat shrink tubing. And for our listeners that aren't aware, heat shrink tubing is used in a couple of ways in med tech. One, as a manufacturing aid to build or manufacture composite catheter shafts where it's discarded and not part of the product. And two, as a, a covering for components within a, a device, which in that case, it stays with the product. And FEP heat shrink tubing is one of the, probably the big items that is used as a manufacturing aid to develop composite catheter shafts. It's 
peeled away. The gold standard in FEP heat shrink is the peelable heat shrink, Zeus, Juncosia, and it's discarded. Um, it's not part of the device. And then we have PTFE, another poly fluoropolymer heat shrink, PTFE, high temperature resistance. That's a covering for uh, sensors and electrical components, a very high shrink ratio, 10 to 1, I think. No, maybe that's not 10 to 1. Uh, I was looking at my notes, but the wall thickness may be down to like a thou. And then we're, so we're going to get into a little bit PET heat shrink tubing, very thin wall, I think down to like maybe one and a half tenths used as a covering for, correct me if I'm wrong there, um, covering for a hypo tube or for a braid or coil wire termination. And that kind of brings us in to some of the other niche heat shrink tubing, polyolefin heat shrink tubing. Again, a covering for sensors, electrical items, and uh, PBAX heat shrink tubing. I know that you're involved with both. So uh, tell us a little bit about some of the challenges with supply chain, maybe with PET heat shrink that is causing folks to kind of look at maybe alternatives or substitutes in that space. You're absolutely, absolutely right, generally, about heat shrink tubing. I, when I first saw a market research study of the size of this industry i couldn't believe how big hmm. the heat shrink tubing industry is and it's a you know multi-billion dollar global commodity of which the medical piece is like everything else right the medical device piece of the heat shrink tubing industry is a couple percent hmm. at most by value and it's much higher value than the commercial things that you can buy at your local electronics store or that are used in wire and cable. Uh, but as you said, right, this is, is used in basically every different type of manufacturing in more or less the same types of applications for encapsulation, for insulation, for wire. You think about a, the classic strain relief. Mm -hmm. on a piece of wire and cable it's it's a it's a little piece of heat shrink tubing that bridges the bigger diameter to the smaller diameter and provides some insulation and weather protection and, and everything else it's sort of like i mean i we talk about it as being kind of duct tape for medical device engineers mm -hmm. because it i really think in many different environments you know people just that is the go-to solution and right? if you have an issue You'll figure out if you can solve it with heat shrink tubing because it's around you don't have to have exactly the right you know id it mm -hmm. you know you've got some flexibility you just hit it with a heat gun or a hot box and and you get the right dimension and so it 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 comes down and it's a nice way to solve a problem um so our history as dsa heat shrink tubing is an integral it is sort of the core of our offering maybe even more than just regular extruded tubing mm -hmm. and personally right when i joined dsa 30 years ago we were representing zeus industrial products so i went through a very rigorous training mm -hmm. process on on heating tubing particularly in fluoropolymers and we expect everyone to understand on our team each piece of that offering and you know, one of my colleagues talks about this, and I think she's right, that this is a, a product that most people are believe that they're familiar with. They are familiar with. They use at least one of them. But it's a very technical offering because each one of those polymers in a heat shrink form is, reacts differently. It has different temperature requirements. It has different performance uh, characteristics. It, as you referred to, the shrink ratios are different. Mm -hmm. What's accessible in terms of wall thickness is different. Colorants, uh, you know, many, many different uh, things. And particularly, the, for instance, the heat at which you recover the product, whether it's transparent to a certain type of laser for laser bonding. I mean, there are many, many mm -hmm. criteria. And the challenge, I think, that we, we frequently see is folks will often make an assumption that that having used FEP heat shrink, for instance, they can then pick up a piece of PET and use the same process and the same parameters and criteria. It's gonna and it's gonna work out, <laughs> and that's not the case, right? 
every one of them behaves really, really differently from the others. So obviously the world leader in, in uh, fluoropolymers generally, but fluoropolymers for medical devices is Zeus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they uh, just, I think, were completely overwhelmed when, with the both demand and the challenges coming out of this. And, right. and most of the rest of the industry has tried to jump in and either take advantage of that or assist people in, in finding al alternate sources. But it's, it's certainly still a challenge. What you see as a result in the early stage R&D, how are we going to make our product? Right, because again, it comes back for early stage venture capital funded folks. You need to make a you need to make a device, right? Your company is burning money and, uh, and time. You're not going to wait for that. So right. what we've seen is just a tremendous creativity around looking for other alternatives. Whether that means that you know you go to Chamfer and you say, uh, "Yeah, I don't know who this company is, but they got FEP heat shrink. I'm yeah. buying it." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is it gonna is it gonna twist maybe a little more? Right, because it, again, back to that technical yeah. piece. One of the real challenges and the reason why not anybody can make that qualifying FEB heat shrink is when you shrink it down. If you're making a very you know thin long catheter, you can't have it twisting as yeah. it's recovering, and that's that would be inherent to, to the manufacturing process. So. Unless that's very, you know, well done and tightly controlled when it's being made, it's not going to behave the same way as as the stuff you've been used to getting, mm -hmm. you know, that gave you a nice, even recovery all along the, the thing. But if you're in you know, making your first 10 units, yeah. hey, you know, <laughs> you can do what you got to do, right? Take what you can get. So, yeah. So I should, you know, just say, you know, even though I know the market perception is around for Nordson that that somehow the supply is down, you know, because the web store is down and they've they've been challenged to to keep up the small um, things. This tremendous investment there, the mm -hmm. capacity has been doubled. They ran, I know, they ran more tubing last year by a lot than they did in any prior year, wow. and they're way above that that number so far this year but there's still a challenge particularly for early stage folks in actually getting what they need so one of our roles as both on the on the principal side on the representing that telling their story that's part of our job mm -hmm. from a customer point of view our job is to help our customers find out some way to get it done right yeah yeah uh, whether that comes from one of our partners or not, you know, we just try and, you know, do the best that we can to, to help out. You know, some of the, the challenges in the value chain are because of some, some of the folks or companies are just exiting the market, right? We see that in the fluoropolymer space with 3M and I believe Salve kind of exiting around 2025 or whatever it is, putting more pressure on the big suppliers like Daikin and Camores for just materials. And I believe, and I don't know if it's official, but one of the providers of PBAX heat shrink and maybe a multi-layer PBAX heat shrink might be exiting the market too, putting further pressure on supply chains. I, I don't have any particular insight into what is going on with with TE and, and so they're in in PBAX heat shrink for medical devices. There are two mm -hmm. basic players. Cobalt Polymers created that product ten years ago as a response, particularly for customers who wanted to have a PBAX layer over a tapered wire or okay. a tapered shaft. Yep. So it's a nice, elegant way of doing that, um, where. You know, a reflow is challenging, and particularly in a very thin wall. So that that was sort of the the original uh, concept, and then there are many interesting characteristics that have turned out from that. Right? It actually is sort of self adhesive. Right? When you shrink it, it will actually bond onto the underlying substrate. It will create a thermal 
bond with another polymer as it melts that. So it, it turns out there's lots of interesting things about that. And, and, you know, as usual, when you put a tool like that into creative R&D people's hands, they do all kinds of crazy, amazing things with that. Mm -hmm. TE entered that market as well, I think six or seven years ago with an interesting spin on it with a kind of a dual layer yeah. product and invested quite a bit in this. But what we, we have definitely seen some, I don't know if it's a formal withdrawal from that or just mm -hmm. that it's been hard for people to get that product. Fortunately, Cobalt's capacity doubled hmm. two years ago. It's been increasing. And so there, there's not really a constraint, but it's a great example, though, uh, of another thing, which is, you know, typically making that shift from even, you know, like for like, um, once you've, you know, once you're in production for sure with a medical device, it's really a challenge, right? I yeah. mean, it, it's new biocomp, new validations, new whatever it is. I think, you know, the other impact that we've seen in the pandemic and when a supplier quality issue or a supplier's um, inability to get you the product at all means that mm. you're not going to ship product, people move really, really fast. Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, you know, timelines for how long it takes to do that and whether or not you're going to fund that, that shift, they, you know, the old estimate that it was going to be, you know, a year or 18 months or whatever to qualify a new supplier, people manage somehow to qualify new suppliers really, really fast. So yeah. we've seen a, a ton of innovation and I think, you know, lean response. And, you know, when you talk to uh, the biggest medical device companies, they will point to that response as something they're very proud of over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. They actually, everybody kind of came together and eliminated hurdles made sure they did what they could because if they can't supply medical devices, you know, what's the point? That's, that's their yeah. goal. They gotta, they gotta make product and, right. and get it into hospitals and take care of patients. So, right. I believe uh, cobalt has a new offering, right? A higher durometer heat shrink tubing out of PBACs. Is that right? Yeah. So they've been for the last year or so added a 74 D product, which is at the highest end of the of the PBAX offering. And we definitely, I think some of our, for sure, a number of our customers use that as an extrusion. But as we, it's, I, I think it's, it's higher than most folks are, are used to. I, I think in the PBAX family, yeah. the general perception maybe is that it tops out at 72D. Um, not to go down a complete rabbit hole, but you know, the, the other, thing that I think is fascinating about PBAX is right, the labeling of those uh, different products, right, mm -hmm. as 70D, 72D, 74D, suggests obviously 35D, 40D, that those actually correlate to the actual durometer of the material, which they don't, right? Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> the, the actual difference between, you know, 70D and 72D I believe one is 61 durometer and one is 66. Um, that's a big difference. That's yeah. a lot more than 70 to 72. Similarly, you know, the, the flexural modulus of the, the 70D is vastly, you know, different than, than the 72 product. So not to, I guess, sorry to jump down yeah. there, but what, you yeah. know, like in terms of one of the roles that, that we play in just in terms of offering alternatives and conversation is just to say, you know, okay, well, you got that thickness, the thing's a little stiff. You want it to be, what do you want to do? Do you want it to be more stiff? You want it to be more flexible? And you have options, right? You can change the wall thickness. You can change the durometer. You can, can go in a bunch of different ways and, yeah end up hopefully with a product that works for your application. Yeah, that's a good point about how the, the durometers are, or just the signification of, of 60D, 70D, and what it actually is. It, this doesn't really correlate very closely. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if it ever 
if ever did i i, yeah, I don't know yeah. how yeah. that how that happened but yeah i mean common common issue so let's move on to um laser gut hypo tubes and yeah. for more advanced catheters that require higher deployment forces increased flexibility and torque response we see a laser gut hypo tube and traditionally on the outer jacket of a composite catheter shaft we have variable durometers we we're just talking about p-backs is the typical right different durometers proximal to distal on the shaft sure, you might have seven, seven yeah. or ten or fifteen different things right. end up there right From along the way absolutely 72 d maybe down to 25 35 yeah. and in one of our recent conversations you mentioned a, an elegant design because of the the ability to to change the cut pattern and therefore change characteristics of the the backbone the hypo tube that possibly a multi durometer jacket is not required and sometimes a, a, just a single durometer um, would suffice because the the backbone the laser cut hypo tube is doing all the work talk to us a little bit about that a little bit more elegant design that you mentioned sure and and just to expand on, on that for a, a moment i mean i think that you know the amazing thing about those designs utilizing laser cutting and you know, we should say sometimes also, you know, a spring that's laser welded on there, yeah. a, uh, a 3D print metal printed tip that can be, you know, welded onto the end, right? I mean, these can be the bone of it, you know, the backbone of it, as you said, can be that laser cut IPO tube. Many other pieces, you know, are being added in there, a, a platinum, you yeah. know, component for a marker band. Marker that, band. So the you know, we started for sure these these you know began commercially appearing 10 years ago and in, in particularly high-end peripheral vascular interestingly and then neuro designs i think mm -hmm. initially and then as you said right structural heart has some and some of those i mean the the mechanical requirements are just tremendous and you can't have a component that that pulls right apart and, and so puzzle piece designs and other, you know, amazingly cool designs. The great thing about, about the process as well, and the cost has come way down, right? So where it used to be at a, you know, at a certain price point, the, the market price of those components now is half of what it used to be, maybe hmm. less. Yeah. Uh, wow. But, and that's a function of the change in, in laser approach different uh, systems as well that have been developed specifically for tube cutting and other things and you know it's a, a place where you know we focus we have a lot of focus on polymers but dsa has supported that and supplied that business for a long time we're active there as well to provide a full solution for those types of catheters but sorry for that little commercial detour yeah, no problem the uh <laughs> the um what i think you know we've seen is that people start with that and they go awesome i've got this great design for this thing now i of course i need to put a polymer jacket on top of it and when you do a reflow there are some real challenges with that uh not least that when you actually shrink the when you melt the polymer into your laser cut ipo tube you have the polymer typically flowing into the interstices of of the mm -hmm. product into the design maybe that works maybe it doesn't right it certainly changes the performance characteristic of this beautiful hypo tube that you've just spent all this time you know designing and i think in early stage that's really a problem yeah. i think by the time it gets to production you know they it gets locked down and they they know what's going on and but for early stage folks, that's a, a real challenge. What has been the sim easier way to do this is take a heat shrink tubing, whether it's PET or PBAX or something else, find one that matches up you know, well to the flexibility that you're looking to achieve and shrink that along the entire uh, length of that device. The advantage there is you're not, you know, it's going to bridge those things the PBAX bonds actually onto the hypo tube 
itself so you don't see it when you bend the thing mm -hmm. it doesn't, you don't see the little folds and wrinkles yeah and other stuff which is a problem you want that bond between the polymer and and the metal and again typically what we would say is you know build the performance into the metal don't build the performance mm -hmm. into the polymer but we definitely have there are definitely examples where you need to either have a lower as you said kind of a lower durometer tip or you want something even more rigid than uh, than the uh, polymer and the tube is at the at the back end yeah and one of the ways to do that is i think it's a flip on the traditional reflow approach which is you know use the use that heat shrink layer as the reflow but leave it in place mm -hmm. so if you, if you want to build something in underneath put those enhancements put those other polymers underneath that jacket that way you have a uniform jacket it doesn't come off you can again it doesn't have to be a heat shrink underneath the heat shrink it right. can just be a thin layer of a of a nylon it, it can be a thermoplast a thermoset material that doesn't melt you know if you could encapsulate a polyimid tube or or another metal or mm -hmm. or Know, many other things but the advantage of that of that PBAX heat shrink is that that's adhesive property of the material is actually going to hold everything together flow everything underneath it you can actually even use it to create a bond to a free extrusion at the end just with an overlap and uh, mm -hmm. build in whatever you need so I, I think we're seeing some really interesting developments happening there with that approach and again sort of highlighting that intersection of, of commercial innovation, everything else. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this would happen as much if you could buy the FEP, but it's kind of hard to get. Yeah. And so again, if you can eliminate both the cost, the technical challenge of doing it and end up with a better product, we think this is a really nice way to go. Right. Excellent. Very interesting. Hey, Barry, this has been a great discussion. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for listening to MedEx, the medical extrusion podcast presented by U.S. Extruders. Please subscribe to make sure you're getting the latest episodes. For video episodes, go to us-extruders.com forward slash podcasts. All links are available in the show notes.